Dr. Ranjani Parthasarathy is a professor in the Department of Information, Science and Technology, Anna University. Her area of specialization is computer architecture and networks. One of her special interests is Indian language technology systems. She is actively involved in research in all the areas and has over 50 publications to her credit. She has about 25 years of experience covering both industry and academics. Welcome to the UGC lecture series in computer science. This is part of a series of lectures on computer architecture. So, we are looking at control unit design in the area of computer architecture. So, when we talk of uh, control unit design, we have looked at some basics of uh, how the design needs to be done, how the different control signals have to be generated. And in the previous topic, uh, previous lecture, we looked at a topic called pipelining. So, we talked about introducing pipelining in order to improve performance. And then with respect to the MIPS architecture, we saw how the pipelining can be done. We saw that the MIPS pipeline can basically be divided into 5 stages, the IF, ID, EXE, MEM and the write back stage. Um, these are terms that we will keep repeating often. So, by the time we come to the end of computer architecture, you will be very, very familiar with these terms. The 5 stage MIPS pipeline is used as a standard for understanding many concepts. Okay. In today's lecture, what we will be looking at is some of the issues that occur in a pipeline design and we will also look at some more details on the design as such. So, a quick recap of what we have been looking at in the previous class. So, if you look at this um, idea of pipelining, we see that we are able to get better performance or finish things faster in a pipelined architecture just by starting a job, starting the next job even before the first job finishes. So, that is the idea. So, if I have 5 different subtasks the IF, ID, ALU operation data access and register access. Now, I do not wait for this entire thing to be completed before I start the next instruction. I can start it as soon as the fetch is over which is what we are doing here in the pipeline access. If we do this, we are able to do, you can see that at any given point of time there are many things happening in parallel. Therefore, the overall time taken is reduced. So, this is what we saw with respect to pipelining. Now, the question that we look at is, is pipelining just so simple? Okay, the answer to that is, it is basically yes, but of course, there are some issues that need to be handled. So, what are these issues that need to be handled? Uh, one of the primary uh, problems that we have with pipelines are what are called as hazards. So, we need to understand what we mean by these hazards. So, if you look at a hazard in very simple terms define it as any situation that prevents starting the next instruction in the next cycle. Now, remember idea of pipelining itself is based on the fact that in every clock cycle I should be able to start a new instruction. So, which obviously also means that every clock cycle I will be finishing one instruction. Okay, So, that is the um, fast execution that we are expecting. So, if there is any situation that is preventing you to start from starting the next instruction next cycle, then we say that we have a hazard. Okay, There is a pipeline hazard. Now, this pipeline hazard can occur due to various reasons. It may be what we call as a structural hazard. So, what we mean by structural hazard? This means that some structure or some resource which is required is busy, is being used by some other instruction. When a resource is busy, is being used by some other instruction, then obviously a new another instruction cannot use the same resource. So, then we say that the pipeline cannot proceed further and therefore, we have a structural hazard. Okay, This is one hazard to uh, look for. Second is what is called as a data hazard. Now, this happens when we need to wait for the previous instruction to complete its data read or write before you can start the next instruction. Now, remember there will always be dependency between instructions okay? and the dependency could be a data dependency or a control dependency. So, what we mean by data dependency is that uh, the output of one instruction will have to go as input to the next instruction. Now, obviously, until the output has completed, until the previous instruction has completed its output, has written the data, the next instruction may not be able to read the data from the register. So, in which case you may have to wait until the previous instruction completes before the next instruction can start. So, in this case we say we have a data hazard. Okay. Uh, the third is a control hazard. Now, this happens uh, whenever we have control instructions in place that is the deciding on the control action depends on the previous instruction. So, let us say we have a branch on equal instruction. So, now if I have a branch on equal instruction which has come into the pipeline, which is let us say it was in the IF stage, now it has gone into the ID stage. Now, when the question is 
uh, in the next clock cycle which is the instruction I need to fetch. Since we have a branch on equal instruction based on the outcome of the branch instruction that is whether the condition was met or not you would either be picking up the instruction which is coming in sequence or you will be picking up an instruction from what we call as the target address from wherever you are supposed to jump to. So now which instruction is coming into the pipeline I cannot decide that until the branch outcome is known. So here again there will be a delay for me in deciding which instruction can be brought into the pipeline. So this we call as a control hazard that is it is some problem that we get because of the because we do not know in which direction the control has to go. So we call this as a control hazard. So therefore there are these three types of hazards that we need to watch out for so structural hazard, data hazard and control hazard. So three hazards that we need to watch out for and that we need to prevent. So as we said structural hazard happen because of conflict for use of a resource. An example for a structural hazard in our uh, MIPS pipeline would be actually uh, if we had used a single memory for both our data access and instruction access that is if our instruction memory and data memory were a single memory unit that we had then we would actually have had a structural hazard ok. But what we have actually done is in the pipeline data path we have used separate instruction memory and a separate data memory. Now the reason that we used separate instruction and separate data memory itself is in order to avoid the structural hazard. If we had both of them accessing the same memory you will find that there are two stages the IF stage the instruction fetch stage where the uh, memory has to be accessed and the mem stage again where the memory has to be accessed. Now both these accesses of two different instructions cannot take place in the same clock cycle if we had a single memory. So one of the ways in which we handle structural hazard is by duplicating the resource or by splitting the resource or something. So in this case we have split the resource and said that we have a separate instruction memory and a separate data memory and therefore we have gotten rid of this structural hazard that we see here. If you did not get rid of the structural hazard then what would happen is that the instruction fetch would have to wait until that particular access got completed. So we say that the instruction fetch will have to stall for that cycle ok. So this term that we use called pipeline stalls. A stall basically means that pipeline just cannot grow further it will have to wait at that particular stage. The other instructions ahead can move further but this instruction will have to wait and not allow other instructions to come in. And this stall we also call it as ca causing a pipeline bubble ok this is a term that we use in order to understand what is happening. So we will just take a look at this. Next that we looked at is a data hazard ok. So now we said data hazards come because of dependencies that we have ok. So let us look at this instruction here. So let us say I have two instructions an add instruction and a sub instruction. The add instruction is going to add two registers T0, T1 and write it into register S0 this is the destination register. The sub instruction is going to subtract T3 from S0 and write it in T2. Now see there is a dependence between this add and subtract. The value written by add has to be read by the subtract instruction. So let us look at how this causes a hazard in our pipeline. Now look at our pipeline we have the IF, ID, EX, MEM and write back stages. So the add instruction let us say comes in in a particular clock cycle here and will move to the next stage in the next clock cycle and so on and finish in the fifth clock cycle let us say. Now let us say the sub is the next instruction that has to come in for execution. Now where should it have been fetched? It should have been fetched over here ok. If it was fetched here it would have decoded in this clock cycle and the decode stage is when the register has to be read. So the S0 register ok will be read in this second clock cycle but the add instruction is going to write S0 only in the fifth clock cycle over here between this 800 to 1000 in this duration is when the write is going to take place ok. But you want to read it between 400 to 600 obviously if you read S0 in this clock cycle you will not get the updated value which is to be got from the add instruction instead you will get some old value of S0. If you access that and continued your execution naturally the answer will be wrong. So what do we have to do? We have to wait until this instruction ok the first instruction will write the value into the register and only then I can read it from the register ok. Now in fact this writing and reading of registers if we assume that the writing and reading takes only 100 picoseconds each we can actually divide the entire 200 picosecond time available into 200 picosecond halves and say that the write will take place in the first half and the read will take place in the second half ok. So if you do write here and read here in the second half at least 
you can make sure that if you wait for two clock cycles and read the value in this clock cycle, the value written by the add will now be read by the subtract. Okay. So, what do I need to do therefore? I do not fetch in the next clock cycle, I do not fetch in the next clock cycle either. So, I introduce what is called as a bubble here and this bubble is the one that will keep going from one stage to another. Okay. Another bubble introduced over here, so there are two bubbles which will be there okay. and then when the first instruction has come into the mem stage at that time I go and fetch the next instruction which is the sub instruction. So, that now by the time this comes to write back and writes the register this instruction will move to the id stage and read the register in the second half and so this will now get the correct value which is the output of the add instruction. So, this is a bubble that will have to be introduced in order to take care of this data hazard. If we did not introduce this bubble that is if we did not stall for two clock cycles then we will see that we will have a wrong output at the result of the sub. The sub will not get the updated value of S0 it would have got some old value of S0. Therefore, we have to stall for two clock cycles in order to take care of this data hazard. So, this is something very important. So, whenever we have an instruction sequences in programs we have to look for these dependencies and see if these dependencies will cause a hazard or not. Now, remember that every program will have dependencies. If there are no dependencies your program may really not do anything useful at all. So, there will be dependencies, but you have to see whether the dependence will cause a hazard or not. Okay. So, if two immediate instructions are dependent on one another a cause of a hazard is possible. So, then we need to do something in order to make sure that the hazard does not occur. Okay. So, this is something that we have to worry about. Okay. So, one of the ways in which you can handle this uh, hazard okay, is of course, as we saw by stalling. Now, can we do better than stalling? Can I reduce the this wasted clock cycles? Okay. So, if you look at that a little more carefully we can see that there is something called forwarding a technique called forwarding which can be used in order to reduce this stall cycles that we have. Okay. So, let us see how that can be reduced. See if you look at what is happening here uh, when the first add instruction gets executed the S0 value is updated in the register only in this write back clock cycle, but the output is actually available the value okay, the T0 plus T1 value is available as soon as it is calculated which is in the ex stage that is at the output of the ex stage at a time 600 the value s0 is actually available, but I wait until it is written to the register and then only I am reading it from the register. So, instead of reading it from the register if I can forward it from the output of the ex stage to the next instruction which needs it if I am able to do something like that then you will see that you can avoid this bubble that comes up ok this is what we will uh, see in this example now. Okay. So, we use this technique called forwarding that is what we are saying here is you use the result when it is computed that is as soon as it is computed you can use the result you do not have to be wait for it to be stored in a register. Okay. So, without waiting for it to be stored in a register use the result as soon as it is computed. Okay. Of course, for this we will require some extra connections in the data path. Okay. Originally we had assumed that all the reads will take only from the register file, okay. but now if you want to forward from the output of the exe unit back to the input of the exe unit you will have an additional data path that needs to be introduced. If we do that then you can see that with forwarding we can reduce the number of stall cycles that we have. Okay. So, we will take a short break now and come back and continue. Welcome back after the break. So, we were just looking at how pipelining has to be handled and we were looking at some of the hazards that occur in a pipeline. So, we talked about three types of hazards structural hazards, data hazards and control hazards. So, we are now looking at data hazard and we are also looking at a technique which can be used in order to reduce the number of stall cycles that come when you have a data hazard. The technique we are looking at is forwarding. So, we just said that the idea of forwarding is that we use the result as soon as it is computed and do not wait for it to be stored in the register. And of course, for this we introduce an, a new extra connection in the data path. So, what is it that we need to do therefore? So, you can see what will happen here. So, I have my add instruction coming in the first clock cycle. In the next clock cycle, I allow my sub instruction to be fetched. Okay. But now, in the decode stage if I read the value of uh, S0, I would have got a wrong value. Okay. 
but when is this s0 value required when this instruction goes into the execution stage when is this going to go into the execution stage only between this time in the at time 600 at time 600 the value is available at the output of ex right because add has completed execution so at at 600 time the value s0 is available here so all i need to do therefore is from the output of ex if i am able to feed it to the input of ex for the next stage i can forward the data from here to here and therefore i will get this instruction now can execute with the new value of s0 that was calculated by the previous instruction okay and then this can continue and do its right meanwhile the first instruction will continue and complete its right in the time period between 800 to 1000 so this will anyway happen but all we have done by doing this forwarding is avoided that stalling of two clock cycles which is what we said we would have to do in order to handle this data hazard so we can see that this forwarding or which is also called as uh, known as bypassing so bypassing or forwarding is a technique that is commonly used in pipelines in order to avoid the data hazards we saw an example of a um, a forwarding technique which will allow us to handle a data hazard now there may be some time some cases where even with forwarding you will still have to have a stop okay so let's take an example of that case let me take an example of a load followed by an instruction which is using that value of the load which is loaded by the load instruction okay now you will see that you can't always avoid stalls by forwarding okay now when is that going to happen that is when i really need the value if that value has not been computed then obviously i can't forward it right so this is what we are talking about that is you can't forward backward in time so forward can happen only if the value is already available later i can use it you can't go back in time so that is what we are trying to say here okay so let's look at this example so we have a load instruction load s0 from some memory address given by 20 plus t1 so now fetch decode execute mem now when is this s0 going to be available now remember not at the output of the ex stage only at the output of the mem stage because this value has to be got from memory okay so the value is available over here okay so now in the second clock cycle if i had brought in my sub instruction so you have a load followed by the sub instruction here sub dollar t2 dollar s0 t3 so s0 is used by the sub okay so if my sub had come in in the uh, second uh, clock cycle it was fetched here decoded here and executed here now remember when this is getting executed that value is not yet available okay so i could not have brought in this if over here so therefore i will have to stall for one clock cycle but if i stall for one clock cycle then in the next clock cycle if i bring the uh, sub instruction into the pipeline fetch it here and decode it here when it is ready to be executed i can see that the value is available from the load instruction okay but where is it available it is available at the output of the mem block okay or the output of the mem stage the value is available so from the output of the mem stage if i can forward it to the input of the exe stage then with just this one bubble or one stall cycle i can have the execution of my sub instruction remember if i didn't do this either without this forwarding i would have to wait for two clock cycles before the instruction can be fetched because write back will happen only over here only then i can read it and so on okay so by doing this one more forwarding okay forwarding from the output of the mem stage to the exe stage to the input of the exe stage you can see that we reduce one stall cycle you still have one stall cycle okay there's one stall cycle which we still have but we have reduced one stall cycle okay and therefore performance improves slightly okay so you can see that you can't always avoid stalls by forwarding you may have to have a stall cycle sometimes okay so this is so by combination of using forwarding and stalling you will be able to handle the data hazards another technique that is used uh, to handle these uh, data hazards and to avoid stalls okay is basically to reorder the code in order to provide a distance between the instruction which produces a result and the instruction which consumes the result now the problem we had here was you have a load instruction you had a sub instruction immediately following that now if in between load and sub if i if there was some other instruction which was brought in over here okay which was not dependent on this load then obviously that could have executed in this in between clock cycle okay without causing any stall and by the time the sub came in for execution if it was fetched in the next clock cycle with this forwarding path in place we would have gone ahead without any stalls so this is another commonly used technique that we have which is scheduling the code in order to avoid stalls okay so how do we reorder the code 
let us say for instance you had this code uh, a equal to b plus e and c is equal to b plus f ok. So, this is two pieces of code that we have. So, typically how would you write it? You will have to load b, load e and then add and then store the result into a. Now, if you have already loaded b, you do not have to load it again. You just load f, add it to the value which is there to the register which has already got b in it and then store the value in c ok. So, if you look at the code for that here, you have a load t1 which is let us say the first load and then load w t2 ok and then you have an add t2, t1, t3 ok. So, now you can see that when this add follows this load, there is a dependence here. So, there will be a one clock cycle latency here ok and then you have a store instruction no problem with respect to that ok. Then again we have a load for the f ok and then there is an add which is b plus f ok. So, again this add follows the load. So, there will be a stall cycle here ok and then you have a store ok. So, let us say this whole thing would have taken up about 13 clock cycles to execute in our pipeline. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 plus 2 stall cycles ok. So, 9 plus the time taken to fill the pipeline and end the pipeline will totally take you 13 clock cycles. Now, the same thing ok. Let us see how you can reduce the stalls over here. Now, what did we say we should do for uh, rescheduling the code? Now, between this load and this add, I have to put some other instruction which is not dependent on this load ok. So, we can see that from the instructions below here, I cannot move the store because this is dependent on the add, but this load instruction here is independent of these instructions. So, this load instruction now can be moved into this position which is what we have here. This load instruction is moved over here. So, now what happens between this load and the add? we have got one extra instruction that has come in. So, there is some distance that we have created. So, this add now will not stall because of this load ok. Similarly, between this load and add ok, here also we had a stall. Now, because we moved this load up here, between this load and add now there is a two cycle difference. Therefore, this add also will not cause a stall ok. So, without stalls this whole thing now will complete faster. So, it will take only 11 cycles to complete. So, the two stall cycles that we had here can easily be avoided if you do some simple rescheduling of the code. Code scheduling is just something which is normally done by compilers in order to avoid the stalls ok. So, this is another technique that we normally keep in mind. So, we have looked at structural hazards and now we have looked at data hazards a little bit into control hazards before we can look at the actual um, pipeline design. So, control hazards if you look at control hazards as I said uh, control hazards are caused because of branches ok. So, the branch is something which determines the flow of control. Now, whenever I have a branch instruction remember fetching the next instruction depends on the branch outcome ok and the pipeline cannot always fetch the correct instruction ok because it will still be working on the id stage of the branch. Remember when the branch instruction has gone to the id stage the new instruction has to come into the if stage. So, if stage does not know which address to fetch the next instruction from ok we need to worry about how to handle. So, you can see if I do not do anything whenever I have a control instruction I will have to stall until I know the outcome of the branch before I can fetch the next instruction whether I have to fetch in sequence or I have to fetch from a new branch address ok. So, this is something we have. Now, in the MIPS pipeline ok if you have a conditional branch for instance then you will have to compare two registers and compute the target early in the pipeline ok. So, now, the way the pipeline is right now, the comparing of registers and computing the target gets done only in the exe stage because we are comparing of registers is a operation which takes place with the help of the ALU and that operation gets done only in the exe stage ok. So, which means until my exe stage um, completes the execution of the jump or the branch instruction, I cannot fetch a new instruction. So, there will be a two clock cycle uh, delay before I can decide on fetching it. So, one way of reducing the number of stall cycles in this case is by adding hardware to do this calculation in the id stage itself. So, I am reducing one stall cycle. In the id stage itself let me add some additional hardware which in case of these kind of special instructions branch instructions will do this address comparison and calculate the address and give it to me. So, that in the next clock cycle at least the new instruction can be fetched from the correct address ok. So, this is something we do. Okay. Otherwise, you will have to stall on a branch ok. So, you can see what is happening here. So, I have a add instruction ok some dollar 4, dollar 5, dollar 6 and then I have a branch equal which is comparing 
dollar two dollar and forty, and then we'll uh, branch the correct address. Okay, forty. Now I have another OR instruction which is following that. Okay, so does this OR instruction can, can this OR instruction start in the next clock cycle? The answer there here obviously is no because only when with this additional hardware that I have added in the ID stage, only when the address is calculated in the ID stage, in the next cycle I can fetch from the correct address. Therefore, one cycle stall will have to be introduced here which is called as a bubble. right? So, one bubble here and then the next instruction can be fetched. Now, by the time we come to fetching this instruction, we know the outcome of the branch. So, either from the branch target address or from the sequential path, we can fetch the correct instruction. Okay? So, this is what we do to handle the uh, stalls on branches. The question that comes up is do I always have to stall on a branch or can I do something better? Okay? Uh, the answer to that is that we use a technique called branch prediction. When we talk of branch prediction, what we normally do is we try to predict the outcome of the branch. That is we do not know whether the branch will either go uh, to the taken path or go through the sequential path, but we try to predict what the outcome of the branch would be. Okay, this prediction could be either based on some static information or can be based on some dynamic uh, flow of the program. Okay, there are very sophisticated techniques available for branch prediction. So, based on which way the branch is likely to go, so you kind of predict which way the branch is likely to go and based on the branch prediction, okay, you will be able to fetch from the target address earlier in the cycle and therefore avoid the stall cycles. Okay. There are some very sophisticated branch prediction techniques that are used. In the MIPS pipeline, you can predict branches not taken and fetch the instruction after the branch with no delay. Okay? This is something which is easy to do in the MIPS pipeline. Okay? But of course, you have to remember that if your prediction goes wrong, then you will have a problem. Okay? So, mispredictions will also have to be handled. Those are some complications that we have. But otherwise, with um, stalls and with additional circuitry and with some amount of branch prediction, uh, control hazards can also be handled. So, to summarize, so we have looked at the different hazards that can occur in pipelines and how they can be handled. So, the different types of hazards we have are structural hazards, data hazards and control hazards. And the way we handle these hazards without any techniques is basically by means of stalls. Or that is you stall the pipeline and introduced bubbles that is there are some idle stages that are introduced into the pipeline. Another way of handling these hazards is by using additional resources in the case of structural hazards. We saw how the additional memory is split into two, the instruction memory and the data memory in the case of the MIPS pipeline. And then the use of forwarding and code scheduling to handle data hazards. We saw two examples of how forwarding can be done. Of course, this requires some additional data path to be introduced. We saw how that needs to be done. And then how control hazards can be handled by means of additional hardware. Of course, there is also something called branch prediction that is used when you are handle, handling control hazards. Some questions to review the contents of today. Question number 1, what is a hazard? Question number 2, what are the 3 types of hazards that occur in an instruction pipeline? Question number 3, how does forwarding help to avoid hazards? Question number 4, what is a control hazard? Question number 5, how can it be handled? Thank you.